In this video, I discuss the answers to the question, what are the rules of the syllogism? First, let's do a quick review of standard form for the categorical syllogism. We know that from previous videos, an argument should be in standard form for ease of evaluation, but as long as you know what the elements are in the argument, you can use the rules of the syllogism, you can apply them without rewriting the argument. Let's look at an example. Crows aren't ravens, and ravens are corvidae, so crows aren't corvidae. Obviously, for those of us already familiar with standard form, the argument isn't in standard form. Um, if it makes it easier for you to work on the argument, in other words, to figure out what the parts of the argument are um, in order to either draw a Venn diagram or, in the case of uh, the rules of the syllogism, apply the rules, um, it would make a lot of sense to rewrite it. Um, but at least if you know what those elements are without rewriting it, you could certainly get to work. Um, the conclusion is the sentence crows aren't corvidae, and we know that that is a universal uh, negative sentence. And that means that we can identify the minor and the major terms, we understand distribution, and so forth. Now let's take a quick look at the rules of the syllogism and then we'll apply them in the case of the argument and we'll also talk about what happens when a, an argument fails to satisfy a rule. First, the middle term must be distributed at least once. Second, if a term is distributed in the conclusion, it must also be distributed in its corresponding premise. Third, a categorical syllogism cannot have two negative premises. Fourth, a negative premise must have a negative conclusion, and vice versa. And lastly, on the modern interpretation only, two universal premises cannot have a particular conclusion. Now, depending on what textbook you have, rule number four might be broken out into two rules. So one rule would say a negative premise must have a negative conclusion, and then a separate rule would say if the conclusion is negative, uh, one premise must be negative as well. In addition, it's worth pointing out that the uh, fifth rule, when uh, not satisfied, means that the argument is invalid on the modern interpretation only. But if the rule is satisfied, uh, that doesn't mean that the uh, argument is valid. Moreover, when you're looking at the um, uh, argument from the traditional standpoint or the Aristotelian standpoint, uh, the satisfaction of Rule 5 um, in the abs absence of satisfying all the other rules uh, does not guarantee that the argument is valid. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to uh, a worked example. So recall the original argument, right, as long as you understand that the conclusion is the sentence uh, crows aren't corvidae, moreover that the uh, conclusion is a universal negative, that the subject term is crows, that the predicate term is corvidae, and then lastly uh, also that the um, middle term is ravens, uh, then you're in a good position to uh, apply the rules without uh, needing to um, uh, put the argument in standard form, but let's go ahead and do that anyway. Then, uh, since corvidae is the major term, that means that the uh, sentence all ravens are corvidae is the major premise, and that leaves the sentence crows aren't ravens, or no crows are ravens, as the minor premise. All right, so let's apply the rules one by one. If the argument fails to satisfy or meet even one of the rules, then the argument is invalid. So if a, an argument fails on rule number five, the argument is invalid. If the argument rules, or sorry, if the argument fails on rule number four, rule number one, right, as soon as the argument fails to satisfy a rule, we know the argument is invalid. So rule number one, we're going to uh, apply to the middle term. So notice that I've highlighted uh, the ravens, the term ravens, and then we have our conclusion. But rule number one says the middle term must be distributed at least once. Now remember, 
the middle term, or sorry, the universal negative and the universal affirmative each distribute the subject class or both distribute the subject class, but only the universal negative distributes the predicate class. Now, so long as Ravens is distributed in one of the premises, then rule number one is satisfied. It doesn't have to be distributed in both, right? That's why it says, that's why the rule says the middle term must be distributed at least once, but it can be distributed uh, in both premises. So take a look at the uh, major premise. We see that Ravens, in fact, is distributed. It also happens to be distributed in the minor premise. If rule number one were broken, the associated fallacy would be uh, the undistributed middle. So the rule would be broken, the argument would be invalid, and the arguments, uh, the, the, the fallacy or the error is called undistributed middle. Now let's move on to rule number two. Here the focus is on the conclusion. What we want to know is whether or not if a term is distributed in the conclusion, it is also distributed in its corresponding premise. So the question is, is either Crows or Corvidae or both distributed in the conclusion? The answer is yes. Remember, the universal negative distributes both the subject and predicate terms. So now we have to ask if the subject term that is the minor term in the conclusion, is distributed in its corresponding premise, and it is, because remember, the universal negative does distribute both uh, subject and predicate classes. And then we look to Corvidae. It's distributed in the conclusion. Is it also distributed in its corresponding premise? And the answer is no. Remember, the universal affirmative distributes only the subject class, it's the subject term, never the predicate term. So this particular argument fails on rule number two because the major term is not distributed in its corresponding premise. It is distributed in the conclusion. So what we understand then is that the argument fails, It the error is illicit major. So now we're done. The argument is invalid we don't need to go on to apply the remaining rules. Remember the moment that a, an argument fails to satisfy a rule, know that the argument is invalid. But let's go ahead and look at the associated fallacies with the remaining rules so that you can see what it is that's gone wrong when uh, a given rule has been broken. So remember, Rule number three says a categorical syllogism cannot have two premises. The associated fallacy is exclusive premises. Rule number four says a negative premise must have a negative conclusion and vice versa. So if you have a negative premise, then you must have a negative conclusion. And if you have a negative conclusion, you must have a negative premise. If that's not the case, then uh, one of these two fallacies obtains, affirmative conclusion and negative premise, or negative conclusion and affirmative premises. And then lastly, on the modern interpretation only, two universal premises cannot have a particular conclusion. Remember, on the modern interpretation, there is no assumption of existential import. So the existential fallacy is committed when you're working on the modern interpretation and you have two universal premises but an, a particular conclusion. For a discussion of the actual fallacies, in other words, what they mean, please see the video, what are the fallacies associated with the rules of the syllogism.